So I want to break down the fundamental theorem of calculus for you. And I want to do part one first. Um, <clears throat> the, fundamental, the fundamental theorem of calculus has two parts. And they're both discussing the interrelationship between integrals and derivatives. Okay, so maybe I, maybe I should lower this a bit. And I will say um, the fundamental theorem of calculus relates integrals and derivatives. Now, it should seem really weird that these two things are related because the derivative is like an instantaneous rate of change. It's a slope of a tangent line. And an integral, that's area under a curve. So like they don't seem like they have anything to do with each other. But what we're gonna see is we're gonna see that they do have something to do with each other. So when you look at the fundamental theorem of calculus, part one, um, what this is really saying is, this is really saying, uh, and, and I'm putting these in air quotes, um, the derivative of the integral is, the same <laughs> is the original thing. That's a very vague way of saying this. So don't tell any math professor I wrote that. But what we needed to think of is we need to think of derivatives and integrals as being inverse processes. So when you watch the video, what, what did you see happening? You would start with some function f of t, dt, and you're going to create a new function called um, that goes from a to x. So this, this function is called capital F of x, right? And this guy looks like an integral. So basically what this does is it takes your starting point a and it calculates the area from a to x. So the x variable lives in the upper limit of integration. And that tells you how far to integrate. Do I integrate from here to here? If I move x over here, then I integrate from here to here and so on and so forth. So what the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us, it tells us that if you were to take the derivative of this guy, the derivative of this function, which is, I differentiate this guy, what do you get? You just get f of x coming out. So this looks like a lot of symbols. And it, it could be a little bit intimidating, but the way that I see it is, I started with little f, I found an integral, I took a derivative, and basically it's like you get the original thing back, you just stick in an x instead of a t. So we're gonna look at some examples here. So um, let's take a look at some examples. Let's say that my f of x is equal to the integral from zero or let's make it two to x cosine of t dt. If I want to find the derivative of this strange looking integral function, all I do is I write the inside function, which is cosine, and then I stick in an x, and that's it. That's your answer. Is there any questions about this? I'm going to have you guys try one. So try this. You have g of x is equal to the integral from 1 to x t squared sine of t dt. I want you guys to tell me what g prime of x is. So we'll take a second to think about it. Type your answer in the chat box. It shouldn't be typing that long. And we'll count it down. Ready? Three, two, one, enter. Yes. Perfect. 
Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, all you do is you write the inside and you replace it with an X. This is X squared sine of X, done. You don't actually do any integration. You know why? Because this is a derivative question. You're taking the derivative, You're not doing any integration. Oh man, that's supposed to be in blue. So what I want to do now is I want to start to um, mess with this a little bit. So let me give you a different example. Let's say I make, call this one h of x, but h of x looks like this, the integral from x to three sine of t dt. What do you notice that's different about this question from the previous questions? Can anyone point out the difference for me? Or mention it, just unmute yourself if you uh, need to. How is this guy fundamentally different from these first two? The X is in the lower. In That's, the right. That's right. As Rocky says, the bottom limit of the integral is an X. So in this theorem, we need X to be on top. <laughs> We need x to be the upper limit of integration. So can you guys remind me, what happens if I interchange these limits of integration? What happens when I flip those? That's right, you pick up a negative sign. So there's gonna be a negative there. And then now I just take the derivative like I did before. So my h prime of x is just going to be negative sine of x. That's it. That's your answer. Does that make sense for everybody? Is there any questions? All right, let's look at another example. There's tons of examples on the video as well, um, but I'm just doing them here separately because you already have access to those other examples. So for this guy, let's say that I did this. I put in um, an integral. I'm gonna go from zero to one over x squared. And let's put in a secant t tangent t dt. So I hope it's obvious. Oh, wait, sorry. Um, integral and antiderivatives are the same. Uh, Stephanie, there's two types of integrals. There's definite and indefinite integrals. Indefinite integrals and antiderivatives are the same. Definite integrals are um, areas under a curve. And that's what the part two of the fundamental theorem of calculus is about. So part two is about definite integrals. We're just doing part one right now. Okay. So, um, so when you look at this guy, you really need to, to draw your attention to this upper limit of integration. And when I see that there, that tells me that um, that tells me I'm going to need the chain rule. This is the inside function. Okay. So when we go to calculate this, we're going to take the derivative of the outside, which is secant something, tangent something. We got to keep the inside, which is x to the negative 2. If you let me write that in exponential form. And I'm going to multiply by the derivative of x to the negative 2. So we know that's going to be secant of x to the negative 2, tangent x to the negative 2. And then this will be negative 2 x to the negative 3. And that's your answer from using the chain rule. Does that make sense for everybody? 
Is there any uh, questions about that? All right. Is that you can have some function where both the lower limit and the upper limit are not constant. And on the inside, you have, I don't know, um, t plus t squared dt. I don't know, whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. OK. So um, to handle this situation, we're going to use something from 4.2. So where's my 4.2? Should have organized this better. So stubborn, I insist on scrolling. I'm like the guy that hits the up button on the remote 50 times rather than searching. I give up though, I can't see my 4.2. Oh, here it is. So when we did 4.2, I showed you a bunch of theorems. And the one that we want to use here is this sixth property. So the sixth property says, instead of going from A to B, you can sort of take a pit stop along the way at some point C, and then go from A to C, and then from C to B. So in this theorem, it's sort of like, this is a two-stop trip that they sort of turned into a one-stop vacation, <laughs> that they regard as one giant trip. We're going to go in the opposite direction. We're going to take our integral and split it into two integrals. And we're going to introduce a constant term in the middle. So what, I'm going to, what we're going to do is we're going to pick some point to split it at. Doesn't matter what point you split it at. I, I usually choose 0 because I love 0. But let's say that. Um, LeBron James is your favorite basketball player and you want to choose his new number six. You can just go from 2x to 6, t plus t squared dt, and then go from 6 to sine x, t plus t squared dt. Now, before I can use the fundamental theorem of calculus, I need to do one more thing. Can you guys tell me what that one more thing I need to do is? Before I can use the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, one small thing here. I think the second integral is fine, but I have some issue with the first integral. Does anyone see what's wrong with this? Of course you do. You see what's wrong with this, right? Luis, are you here? What's wrong with this? Just variable has to be on the upper limit, right? So we got to flip it around, right? So this has to be negative six. I mean, negative. You got to interchange the limits of integration, so you negate. So you got six to two x t plus t squared dt. And now we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus. So you got k prime of x is equal to negative 2x. You know what? Let's put the whole thing in parentheses so you don't forget to distribute the negative. So this will be 2x plus 2x squared. That's the first piece. And then the second piece is going to be sine of x plus sine of x squared. Does that make sense? So you can simplify this by distributing, but I'm going to leave it like this because this kind of shows you know, how you got the answer. Professor? Yes. Where do you get the six from? I just made it up. You don't like six? Oh, you're just making it up? I can pick any number I like. What's your favorite number? Eight. It's OK. Thank you. OK, OK. Let's have it your way. Oh, it doesn't matter? All we care is that it's a constant. It could be oh. zero, it could be eight, it could be six, it could be an odd number, it could be a pi. Thank you. 
Def asks, why do we need to split it up? Is it because there can't be variables on in both limits? That is correct. So if you were to look at the theorem, the lower limit here must be a constant. It's required. <clears throat> Make sense? No problem. <clears throat> 